Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders, a safe space for women to thrive in community where their voices and stories are heard. We're a sisterhood supporting each other to live our dreams and embody the sacred feminine to restore balance on our planet. Join us each week as we return to the unconditional love and guidance of our heart and our womb. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I invite you to walk this path of beauty, devotion, and service with us. here today with Carrie Ingram, who is the founder of Community Supported Postpartum, whose mission is to build ecosystems of care, one community at a time. She contributes to this vision by teaching folks all over the world how to step into the role of village tender by creating local parent and baby groups that get parents out of isolation and into a web of support and care. Carrie is a parent, both biological and foster, an early childhood educator of 20 years, a postpartum doula with additional education in women and gender studies, and maternal mental health care. She's been facilitating local parent and baby groups for over 10 years, which I just got to participate in this year and also got to um, be of support as a, a guest teacher years ago. And she teaches others around the world now how to step into leadership with her Village Tenders postpartum community care course to build their curriculum and business framework for sharing these groups in their community all over the world. So thank you for being here, Carrie. Thank you, Meredith. (laughs) So... I, where to start? I feel like I'm, I want to know what inspired you to start these groups in the first place. Um, maybe we'll just dive into that, but I'd also love to hear about your postpartum journey. So we'll just see what questions arise from there. Well, it's a great question. And, you know, I've been asked that question a number of times and it feels like I can go so far back but into my own childhood. Um, and remembering the kind of high density population um, in upstate New York, where I grew up. And it was just house on house on house. And this was, you know, in the 80s, I was a child of the 80s. And um, how we really took care of each other in this community, we kind of ran free. um, in, In the streets, we of course, there was multi, you know, multi generations in a small space, and we would help carry in groceries when we would see an elder carrying their groceries. We would rake leaves or shovel snow. Um, we would share garden abundance, um, and of course, the parents were always watching out collectively. You would get uh, not only taken in for dinner and snacks, but if you were doing something a little out of line, that other parent would let your parents know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so it really felt um, because of that kind of like high density populated neighborhood that I grew up in, it really felt like a village. And um, it was a unique time. And what that kind of care helped me carry through it when I became an adult and a teacher before a parent. And I was in um, an early childhood and kindergarten setting. So many of the parents were starting to have second children. And when they would drop off their kindergartner in the morning, I would see how they wanted to linger. They wanted to stay and chat with other parents. They wanted to see what was going on in the kindergarten. They smelled, you know, the oatmeal or bread baking, the tea brewing, and there was a longing to be part of of that feeling. And I started to notice when I would just take a moment in the morning and introduce parents to each other or say something like, um, oh, you know, your children love to play here. I wonder 
maybe you could get them together after school or, oh, you know, I see that you're expecting a baby. You should meet this parent. They're also expecting a baby. Um, and just making those tiny connections. Um, it just really, it was something that I noticed as just somebody in the community, um, how helpful that was to other parents and how much they were longing for that to be connected and also what an impact it had, just these tiny little gestures. So the I think that that's part of the story that got me where I am today, many years later. Yeah, it's beautiful how school really sets up that built-in community and support for the children. And if we're lucky, also for the parents. Um, it's something that my partner and I talk about, how we used to see so many more people on a daily basis, <laughs> just having those networks of support rather than being going off on your own and starting your own business and being more in your own zone and your house and um, your friendships. And yeah, I just, yeah, I really feel the thread of how having people around for you growing up really like wove into the rest of your life and became a mission to be able to be a connector and help people. And it's so needed in those early parenting days. It really is. It really is. And sometimes, and maybe you felt this way. I know I sh certainly did. Um, sometimes we're just tasked as new parents with, with already so much. We're recovering, we're calibrating, we're tending to a tiny human with all the needs in the world. There's so yeah. much happening emotionally. If you're in partnership, you're recalibrating in your partnership, you're recalibrating in your family of origin, that constellation has changed. And then to also think, well, now I need to grow my community and build a village and find other <laughs> people. Sometimes that's, it, it's a tall order. Um, and I really feel like as people in the community, or as I call us village tenders, how can we, how can we show up and yeah. facilitate that for new parents? Yeah. And when you were becoming a mother, uh, did you feel prepared or did it surprise you? <laughs> like, <laughs> did you have these systems like set in place? How oh was that? Goodness. <laughs> well, of course, with, well, here's the irony with my background as, you know, I, I was a birth worker before I was a parent. I was a postpartum doula before I was a parent. I was an early childhood educator before I was a parent and was immersed in this early realm, the childbearing year and, and the early realms of parenting. And I had a lot of ideas. I had a lot of notions of what it might be like. I had a lot of um, even maybe a little dogma of what I was imagining. And then, of course, stepping into the reality of it, a big slice of humble pie was delivered <laughs> to my lap. And wow, um, you know, you're you're just shattered open you're obliterated mm -hmm. of what was and it's like a heart obliteration it explodes into a million pieces and in a million directions so was I prepared um no <laughs> I think I was prepared yes <laughs> um I I think one of the you know greatest and simple gifts was the meal train because that's mm -hmm. such a doable action that community you know your community can participate in and it it's it's so much deeper than just bringing meals um it's it's really about being held and nourished it's kind of like a modern day rite of passage in a sense 
um, because your your community now gets to see you in a different way, um, either physically or or not. They may just drop something at the at the door, or if they're far away, you know, call something in to be delivered. Um, but they, you know, you're seen. You're seen for this new space. You are, it's you're acknowledged and recognized that you need something more. You're in the receiving role, the receiving position. And then, of course, food is such a, you know, it's such a connector. And I have a lot of friends with different cultural heritages. And I remember receiving a lot of uh, traditional meals um, from different cultures that that my friends were bringing by. And that's just another level of like community connection and joy when they share a part of who they are with food, um, you know, like a traditional Korean soup, I remember that had lots of seaweed. Um, and I had my boy in the summer and received this like watermelon, ginger, mint fruit salad that was from my friend um, in Mexico. And a, a Persian green rice dish and just so many different uh, dishes that, you know, were traditions in their heritage or in their families and passed through generations. And that felt really special too. So I think that the, the humble meal train is actually something really special. It's a really special gift um, on so many levels. So that that was a, a huge uh, save, saving grace, especially because my uh, son's dad and I are both East Coasters and we had our baby on the West Coast. So we really did have to lean into our community because our families of origin were very far away at that time. Yeah. I can I agree so much with the meal train. If that is something that can happen and yeah, anyone listening who doesn't know what that is, like there's yeah, an opportunity when a new baby comes that we can bring food to the that family. And there's even this website where it helps you just sign up. You can we can create that for people we know. Um and it's so such a nice like you shared was just the ritual aspect of it of like this is not just food like but everything food represents and the nourishment and the being seen and the support i'd love to hear about what your postpartum groups look like how it started um what you why you were inclined to start it and what what did you see in people when you were starting your groups well, I started the group because a friend of mine asked me to. Mm-hmm. Um, I had spent time in parent-child classes before as an assistant, and I felt as though in in my experience, and I'm not saying right or wrong, but I felt as though a lot of the parent-child classes that I had been a part of were very child focused and not so parent focused. And what I saw was parents really longing to talk to each other and for parents to receive the nurturing, because of course, when parents have that nurturing experience, it's so much easier to offer a nurturing experience to your child. When you are resourced, you, your cup is full. Um, and you can pour in and the magic that happens um, when parents can connect with each other. So how it started was when my boy, when my son was two months old, I had a friend who had a baby that was just two months older than my boy. And she says, gosh, Carrie, you know, you've got all of this experience and you've worked in these parent child classes why don't you just create one here and you know I'll come we know this person this person there was a whole cohort of us that all had babies at the same time um locally and 
you know, she says, just put out a basket. We can donate things like maybe money, maybe food, maybe, you know, whatever it is. And maybe you can lead this group. And I thought, well, okay, let's give that a try. So it was when my son was only two months old and it was in my living room in a teeny tiny house. We were squeezed in there like sardines in a can. And it was absolutely magical when we got together and um, we would sing songs because I was a Waldorf teacher and singing songs and playing games was a big part of early childhood. So we would play these games and sing songs and it felt so good to be in that harmony and resonance and joy. And then we would just have conversation and the babies would be moving around or sleeping or eating. And that feeling of togetherness, um, it was really beautiful when we would each get a chance to share. It just felt like those brave conversations would would really normalize what so many of us were feeling. But when you're separate and you're in your own home, you're in your nuclear family, you know, oftentimes we feel like we're the only one this is happening to. I'm the only one, you know, having breastfeeding challenges. I'm the only one where, you know, my pelvic floor hurts. I'm the only one that's having, you know, a feeling of disconnection with my partner. I'm the only one on and on and on. But when you come together and just make space to share, oh my gosh, the sigh of relief, like, oh, I'm not the only one. You know, that's what comes this like normalizing the solidarity of the collective experience that somehow is hidden from us in a way. And then, you know, the next step is well, how do we get help? And someone will say, I know somebody that's a pelvic floor therapist. What? What's her name? And and then all of a sudden we've got our, you know, phones out, entering in somebody's website and, oh, that's great. Or, oh, look at this diaper rash cream that really works well for us. Um, it's It's those little things that are big things too. Because oftentimes in our you know, more like medicalized systems, a lot of the nuance healing and physiological needs are left out of the conversation because oftentimes they're not covered by insurance. Um, But when we can talk about them, I, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we're not talking about them in our appointments. Um, But when we can talk about them, we can normalize them, we can get the resources, and then we can, we can get help. Yeah, I can share just from my experience, I remembered you asking the question, um, like, this is your first year postpartum, you to the group, you just post the question, like, what do you want this year to mean to you or look like for you? Mm -hmm. And, and at that point, my daughter was, I think, five or almost six months. And I was like, wow, I only have like six months left. What do I want this year to mean to me? And I feel like there was a real pivot um, that I made at that point. And I chose nourishment. Like I want this year to really look like nourishment. And I remember we were, it was about the time we were starting to look for a nanny. And my plan was, okay, as soon as we have childcare, I'm diving back into work. I'm going to see clients. I'm going to start bringing in income to su- help support our family. And I just feel like something about the group gave me permission to not have to rush and just like, okay, finally we have a little bit of support. And like, I gave myself a couple weeks of just like before I filling up my cup before diving back into all the productivity and the to-dos and that was so healing. And I think sometimes we just don't even think that it's possible. And for some people, it's not. If they have to go right back to a um, a job with a boss and all of that. But it just, it hadn't really crossed my mind to, to give that to myself. And I did. And I had a couple of weeks where it was just like naps, massage, like time in nature, just some basic things that I hadn't done, like alone time journaling. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. opening a book, like really basic things that had not been happening for those six months before. Um, yeah, so that was really, really healing, simple and profound. Um, I'd love to touch on the early parenting villains that you shared with our group. And yeah, you have a lot of, you know, experience and skills of just what people tend to go through in that first year postpartum and becoming parents and navigating it all. Would you speak a little bit to these early parenting villains and how they came up for you? I love talking about the early parenting villains because I feel like it's the, it's um it's a big perspective shift and I can see when it starts settling into folks especially in a group setting and the impact that it has. So so the early parenting villains are I, I, systems. Um so I can na- I'll name a few of them right now. Productivity culture is one. Um, the diet culture, diet culture is another, um, patriarchy and how that shows up in our medical systems, especially in home, uh, home care, um, antiquated gender roles, uh, capitalism, consumerism. Um, I'll, I'll just leave that where it is. And what those early parenting villains do is they creep in when we're alone and isolated. Um, They are systems that have kind of been part of our conditioning through media, through advertising, through, you know, even our families of origin. This is how it was done. You know, let's not change anything Um, in, in systems, obviously in our work culture, in our economy, and of course, the big commercialization of so many parenting needs. Um, And what these villains do is they, and we're all swimming in the waters. We're all swimming in the same water. We've all been conditioned on, on some level to have these beliefs. And really, these beliefs are to make us feel crummy so that we doubt ourselves and then eventually buy something or abandon our own intuition and needs. So, for instance, for instance, diet culture, we'll say we'll say something about diet culture. You know, we are celebrating, you know, a a pregnant body. We're celebrating this pregnant body. And, you know, this big, beautiful belly. And then the second the baby is born, we are, you know, we want to make that body look like it, it didn't just have a baby. And all of these products are being marketed to lose the baby weight, bounce back. Um, and really, really what needs to happen is a, nur- a nourishing back. And, uh, appreciation for the time that it takes for a body to grow a baby, give birth to a baby, and then recover. And of course, if that body is, you know, breastfeeding, chest feeding, that's, you know, a whole other set of needs. There could be, you know, injury, and there's always like at some level an injury of birth. And diet cultures, you know, just pounding into us to eat less, um, fast, um, detox, all these diets. And really, when you look at what it takes traditionally and just physiologically, you need more calories, you need more nourishment, you need more protein, more fats, more, more, more of everything um, to nourish yourself. You need more rest. You need to rest and recover. And so we're just reckoning with this narrative and starting to feel bad about ourselves. And, you know, these villains, I came to these villains after 10 years of facilitating parent and baby groups because the same, the same self-judgment 
conversations came up over and over and over again. And, and people would start to feel really crummy about themselves. Like, well, you know, I'm just not used to my body like this. It just looks terrible. And, you know, and then there's an impact on how they feel with their partner, how they're dressing. Um, They might start depriving themselves of food or doing meal replacements or fasting. And, you know, what it takes not only for your physical recovery, but, you know, your, your brain has changed your emotions and now you're you're in lack of nutrition it's just going to make you feel worse um so a question that i love to say to to pose to people is when they have that judgment like oh my my body is you know just my body's terrible or i don't like my body you know i like to say is that really your belief do you really believe that and if they say, well, maybe, maybe not. I'm just not used to what it looks like now. I'm like, well, where's that belief coming from? And then it's usually how I think it should look. Well, it should look this way. I see all this like bounce back culture. If you even type in on Instagram, like postpartum body, it's always before and after images. And, you know, the subtext of that is before is bad and after is good. And after is usually thinner. And of course, we have such a fat phobic culture, period. Um, You know, we're just permeated with these messages or, you know, for instance, productivity culture that that caring for a human and caring for your body is not worthy. If And then, of course, we're not getting paid or... um, you know, caregiving is such a valuable resource without it. And I love that caregiving is has now been part of the conversation, especially during COVID, as the core economy or the care economy, of which nothing could be built without it. No jobs, no education system, nothing. If there's not humans caring for other humans, we can't really build any anything on that. So I love bringing up these villains in a group setting because when we are together in community, it's like we unmask the villains together because we all are in the same boat. We've all been marinated in the same waters. And when we're alone, we feel like we're the exception. Like I'm the only one who feels this way about my body. I'm the only one who feels like I'm never doing enough. I'm the only one who thinks I have to buy all of these programs to get my baby to sleep, eat, do this, do that. But it just takes time. And we live in a culture of time scarcity, that there's not enough time and that you should already have this figured out and you should already, you know, be a size four two weeks after giving birth and that you should, you know, should, should, should. And what we really need is time and support. Yeah, when you're in isolation, you just don't even know that other people are struggling. And because it's not not usually what people share when it's like they go on social media, it's like, oh, I want to share this happy image of me and my baby. And it's a lot of times it goes hidden until you, you know, finally make that mom friend or um, have a group like the ones you create and get to be like, no, like this sleep deprivation thing is like, I'm on my last straw right now and just like start to be more honest of what's going on. Um, Yeah. It's so nice to have that, to relate to others in that new time when everything is shifting and changing. Yeah. Yeah. It Um, really is. um, So what, what can we do in that first year postpartum around self-care and just like looking towards changing those narratives? And um, and I know probably a lot of people would say, well, I don't have time. Like <laughs> I have this baby in my arms all the time. What are just some thoughts you have around 
ways we can start to shift that in our homes and our lives? Well, I think that I have to talk about it through two different lenses. One lens is from the perspective of a new parent who's in the receiving position. And one lens has to be through village tending, who is not a new parent, but is part of that parent's circle of support. So I'll start there. If you are identifying as a village tender, which means that you're not a a parent in the early realm, um, what can you do? You, You can learn how to show up and not just say, call me if you need anything, (laughs) but actually have tangible ideas for support. And one way I like to work with that is kind of inviting people to think about their position, their position in proximity to the person in need. So if you're in the inner circle, um, you know, that I would say that's kind of like the, the circle of like connection. And your your way of showing up is really more intimate support, you know, with like listening and presence and empathy, maybe organizing other people to to help, um, maybe being invited into the home to prepare a meal, to do some nurturing care, um, to, you know, hold the baby, to give the mom a cup of tea and a shoulder massage um, to to really just wrap care around the parents. And then if we could think of like concentric, I think it's concentric circles, a circle that's getting larger, that would be, you know, maybe non-intimate support where it's like the circle of service. So maybe people that are neighbors or in your school community, in your work community, that's where the meal train is such a great and easy way to show up. You can bring meals, drop them by, or send a meal, have it delivered if you live far away. Maybe you can walk the dog, you could, you know, lend lend a hand in the yard doing some garden tending or, you know, running errands, call, calling or texting and saying, hey, I'm heading to the market. Can I pick you up anything and leave it on your doorstep? Um, pet care, home care, things like that, so acts of service. And then, and then, you know, thinking even bigger, even if you feel like, you know, I'm not, I don't really know anybody personally that might need this kind of postpartum support, but even that there's a third circle, just the circle of acknowledgement where maybe you don't know this person, but you can hold a door open for them. (laughs) Maybe you can, you know, what's such a task for parents is returning grocery carts when you have a baby. And you want to put your baby in the car seat, then you've got to bring back the grocery cart. Bring back the grocery cart for somebody in the parking lot. Or if you see someone with a baby in line at the deli and you are the next one in line, let them go. Um, Another way is to just pay attention to family-centered, family-friendly policies. You know, have that on your radar and, and, and vote for those things. Bring awareness to those things. Or you know, just acknowledge somebody, smile at them, um, say something positive, you know, just a, a, the outer circle of acknowledgement um, or texts. Texts are another nice way um, of sending something. So as a village tender, it's really about um, just going for it, doing something tangible. Like, what can I do? Just getting someone on the radar and feeling feeling the joy of being part of a community, being of service, because it it really is a lost art how we used to just show up. And I think that there's both um, one roadblock of, oh, I don't want to step on any toes. And that's why you definitely want to think, where's your position and proximity to this person and be in that bubble of consent? And then also, what do I do? Um, you know, let's like think of something tangible instead of call me if you need anything, because, you know, they're probably not going to do that. Um, they don't want to organize that. So that's from the, the lens of village tending. And then from the lens of a parent, you know, it's really about opening the door 
to your community in a way that feels comfortable. So you get to choose who's in which circle as well and how close you want that person because we do want new parents to feel that they're safe and around people that they trust. Um, That's really important. And so there's a saying I, you've probably heard me say, Meredith, in my groups, I say, making requests builds community. So making those requests, you're inviting your community to, to create community. You're inviting that gesture of service and support and connection. You're inviting somebody to maybe make a traditional meal from their family and they get to share that part of who they are. Maybe, I mean, we, we had somebody come one, one time and deliver a meal and play guitar outside of our window and sing to us. You know, that was something that makes them happy. And of course it made us happy. So it's, you know, from the lens of the parent in the receiving position, it's about being able to make a request and state a need, bring a need into being and, um, and, and connect with your community in that way. It doesn't mean you have to organize things. It just means you can ask and ask other people to organize if you need more of a organization. <laughs> and there's yeah. a lot of resources and I'm happy to share a couple of my favorite resources too. Yes. And it takes some, um, it takes courage, I think, to be in that position and to say like, okay, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone and ask for some help. And, um, and it's hard sometimes I've known from experience with friends that haven't had kids just cause it's like, you might hear no. And also they, they might not totally get it, <laughs> what, it, what it's like in going through that phase. And, um, but it's, yeah, building a muscle, like being able to ask for support and to see that most of the time people are really happy. They just didn't know how they could help. <laughs> They're happy to support. It's really true. A lot of people just don't know because it is a set of skills and it's a set of skills that's not really valued, unfortunately. And this is why I do the work that I do. And I feel that how can we skill up the village tenders? Because we do need those people in the community that can step into those roles and organize support for parents and make space for parents. And, you know, leadership, leadership doesn't have to wear a three piece suit, you know, leadership is like, it's what it is to be human. You know, maybe you're a leader in your relationship. Maybe you're a leader in your family. Maybe you're a leader in your community and you don't think of yourself as a leader because it's not what we've been kind of conditioned to think a leader looks like, but, you know, tending to the village, like we've got to be the leaders in human care. Yeah. It's been a big missing piece. And I think of all the parents and probably our parents that raised us in that place of isolation and not being able to talk so openly and honestly or Google something or <laughs> just have the kind of um, resources available to us now. Yeah. And we're, we're getting to heal that too. It's really true. It's culture making. Yeah. So tell us about your course, The Village Tenders. Well, The Village Tenders course is a course for folks who want to take on that leadership role in their community um, to organize support for new parents. So um, the course is kind of born out of my 20 plus years of early childhood education and birth work. Um, and of course, tending to my own local village for the last 10 years and facilitating parent and child groups. Um, what it is, is a it's a course, it's a full curriculum and business framework um, that teaches people how to create and facilitate 
parent and baby groups in their own community. And it has everything from why we're doing this, what what's lacking. I have a whole week on the villains of early parenting and how to bring those conversations every week to your group. Um, I teach you how to connect with your local, I call it the caregiving ecosystem, all of those amazing practitioners in every community from lactation consultants to pelvic floor therapists to marriage family therapists, all the support that we deserve as new parents. How do we connect with those people so that we can connect the dots for our local group, our parent and baby group? Um, I teach how to um, model relationship-based care through songs and games with, with your baby. So you learn fun songs and games to share with your group and um, different models of sliding scale financial accessibility. Um, something wonderful in the local group that I have is a pay it forward option. So there's a sliding scale tuition. And in addition to that, there's pay it forward so that if somebody reaches out to me and needs something less, it is always covered. It's been covered for the last eight years. There's always a fund that's provided by the community um, so that anyone who wants to join can join. Um, and then and then a business framework. I really kind of broke down exactly step by step how to make this fly in your community so that you're resourced as a facilitator and um, and it is a you know it is a stream of income as well. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It gives people everything they need to take their next, you know, steps in, in growing their business. And there's so many people, for example, like a doula who might only, you know, they do, they're there for birth, but then like, what's next? <laughs> it's definitely more sustainable from a business point and also more supportive for this, the people who are having babies to have ongoing support. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of birth workers who take the course. It's an online course. It's two months and it's self-paced, but there's live, there's live, uh, live, I call it co-work time each week where we're on zoom together. And then you, you actually get a full curriculum with over a hundred already made classes for you so that you can just use them and get straight to work. Um, but a lot of parents take this course as well that maybe don't want don't want to or are unable to go back to what they were doing before um, becoming a parent. And this feels like a great first step for them because it's something that is meaningful and uh, fun and a way to just be connected in the community. There's just so many connections. I'm always saying hello to people because for the last 10 years, I, I've been doing this in my local community. So there's hundreds of children and their families that I've been fortunate enough to connect with in such a special time of life. Yes. Anytime I connect with a new mom or someone who works in the the new mothers or birth community. And I mention your name. They're like, oh yeah, I know Carrie. <laughs> well, <thanks. laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything you want to say just about as this ripples out, what kind of vision you, you have for the world, like where it's what you would love to see happen in the world, mm -hmm. knowing that these are reaching more people. You know, I just think this time of life, this season of life is such a time unto itself, the first year after having a child, however that child has arrived, because I've been both a foster parent and a biological parent, and both times I needed to be in the receiving role. Um, because it takes time. All worthy things take time. It takes time to attune to your baby's needs. It takes time to attune to your postpartum body's needs. It takes time to recalibrate in your home life. And 
how can we give parents that time and and actually acknowledge that time as a time unto itself? And I really believe that these groups are such a beautiful way to bring parents together to be seen, to be heard, to be witnessed, and to make their own connections. Um, it's amazing to see parents 10 years later that are still they still maintain these friendships. They're still carpooling with their 10-year-olds and going camping and having potlucks. And that's really what community is all about is the togetherness and that sense of belonging and um, growing roots together. So I, I would just love to see more people that want to step into that leadership role in their community as a village tender to just hold space to make make those brave spaces, those tender spaces for new parents to be held. Thank you so much for doing this work. And we will definitely include the links to your course and your website and everything people need to know about where to find it. Um, anything else you want to add? And also just any closing words you have before I have a short prayer to end this call. I think I would just end it by saying, making requests builds community. Yeah. So make those requests, everybody, and, and just lean in and show up. When you see a need, just, just get a little closer and see how you can be of service. It really builds a healthy family and a healthy community when we can we can say yes to that a little bit more yes and i'll add anyone listening who knows someone who might be crossing that threshold into parenthood think about what you can do without even being asked <laughs> and that's like such a profound gift when we take that step and that person on the receiving end just gets to feel like, wow, that was everything I needed. <laughs> yes. So, thank you, Carrie. Love to just bring the energy into our hearts and just feel our breath. For everyone listening to just take in these words, let it resonate and permeate into our being. May we step out into the world with newfound confidence, courage, taking those steps, making requests, having purpose, bringing communities together in places where there has been a lot of isolation. Yeah, and just may, may we create that change that so many of us are longing for and missing the village and raising our families. So much love and gratitude is bowing to you, Carrie, to everyone listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this episode. If you liked it, share it with a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. You can also follow along on Instagram at Meredith Rom and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com to be sure to receive all the new and inspiring content. Thanks again for being here. It's an honor to walk this path with you.